Well, good morning again. It's always a joy for me to open God's Word with you. I look forward to it when I, whenever I have the opportunity. And uh, today we're going to be uh, studying Psalm 119. Uh, so please turn your Bible to Psalm 119. I've dabbled in this, I guess I could say, uh, various different sermons uh, over the past few years, um, taking little chunks at a time. Uh, and it is such a rich chapter. Uh, it is the longest chapter of the Bible, uh, and it, it is devoted to one topic, and that is, that is the role of the Word of God in the life of a believer. The, the chapter dives deep into the Word of God as it, as it shapes us, as it gives us hope, uh, as it aids us and teaches us in times of trial. Um, we don't know who the author is of Psalm 118, uh, but we do know that he is a believer of God who trusts in God's word. Uh, and, and in fact, you can look at Psalm 119 as a prayer. It is the longest chapter in the Bible, but it's also the longest prayer in the Bible. Uh, and it's all centered around God's prayer. And Psalm 119 is an acrostic, meaning that it is structured in such a way where each Stanza starts with the letter, a, a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So, for example, verses one through eight, you might see in your Bibles, it says Aleph there, or maybe it has a little symbol of like this crooked kind of looking X. Uh, that means every single line, every single verse, verses one through eight, starts with that uh, Hebrew letter, uh, Aleph. And then verses nine through 16, all verses there start with Baith. And the passage that we're looking at today is verses 17 through 24, which is a Gimel stanza. And it, all those starts with, with the kind of the equivalent of the letter G in Hebrew. It all starts with the Gimel letter uh, in the Hebrew alphabet. So it is a, a artistic, it is a beautiful um, psalm put together. Uh, but I think it's put together in such a way as to show us the, the A to Z of God's word in the life of a believer. It is a comprehensive study of God's word and its role in the life of a believer. So we're, we're going to be looking at 17 to 24, and this section contains a very familiar verse. It is a verse that uh, our pastor prays nearly every Sunday, uh, and that's in verse 18, where it says, Open my eyes that I may, may, that I may behold wondrous things from your law. And there's really two things that this section focuses on. Two like basic disciplines that, that are needed in the life in our lives to grow. And, and those two commitment or those two disciplines are commitment to scripture and prayer. You get rid of one or the other, you either become spiritually malnourished or spiritually powerless. There's a commitment to scripture and prayer. So we need both. And this section, this section of, of scripture emphasizes the dependence on God in our study of scripture. You can't approach God's word and it have a, a meaningful impact in your life without God at work. God has to be at work. If we don't depend on God to help us in, in our study of the Bible, uh, there's, there's going to be no impact to our lives. The waves of, of trials, uh, of adversity, um, they're going to seem to overwhelm the harbor of peace that the, the scriptures will otherwise provide. Without God, the words of Scripture will not lead to peace. It will not lead to change. But when we depend on God to teach us, when we depend on God to open the Scriptures to us, and we're committed to, to follow His Word, the, the, the veil goes down. The well of, the, of, of His Word uh, deepens. And we're able to draw from it joy and peace and delight. We're able to know Him more. Because God is at work in us through his word, his word becomes a, a balm to our, to our troubled soul. It becomes a strong tower during those trials. And it brings us into a deeper relationship with God, of, our, God our Savior. So, so yes, we need to have a commitment to the word, a commitment to steady it, a commitment to, to follow it. But it has to be because God is doing something in us. And that's what this psalm is about this morning. What this, that's what this section is about this, this morning. It's about that, it's telling us that we need to earnestly pray to God to teach us his word, but at the same time, we must be committed to what God shows us. And as we seek to know and, and, and to live the Bible, we need to both pray 
and be committed. Both have, be dependent on God and devoted to his word. And, and that's our outline this morning. Simple outline. We'll see in our text the believer's dependence on God. Okay, that's going to be verses 17 uh, through 19. The believer's dependence on God and the believer's devotion to his word. The dependence on God and then a believer's devotion to his word. So please read with me in Psalm 119. I'm going to start in verse 17 and just read through 24. God's word says, Deal bountifully with your servants, that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. I am a stranger in the earth. Do not hide your commandments from me. My soul is crushed with longing after your ordinances at all times. You rebuke the arrogant, the cursed, who wander from your commandments. Take away reproach and content from me, for I observe your testimonies. Even though princes sit and talk against me, your servant meditates on your statutes. Your testimonies also are my, my delight. They are my counselors. Let's pray before we study God's word. Father, we, we just come before you and just want to do what the psalmist did here. How he comes before you and asks for help to study his word. And, and God, we need you to act, Lord. So like just how we sang earlier, we need you to show us Christ. To show us the depths and the richness of your word. So, Father, we come before you as, as your humble servants, as, as, as your sons and daughters who have been purchased by the blood of Christ, that you would help us to see wonderful things in your law today, Lord. Praise Jesus' name. Amen. So when we get to verse 17, the, the psalmist has, has spent time developing this thought. You can see verses 1 through 16 almost as an introduction to the rest of the psalm. Uh, the first section, he tells us that those who walk according to God's word, those who, who walk in the law, who seek him to observe his testimonies, verses 1 and 2 tells us that they are blessed. And that word for blessed, it has the idea that they are living in a way God wants them to live. That they are living in a way that is in divine approval of the, of the Father. And in the second stanza, he says, well, I, I know what, what it requires to be blessed, and how do I do that? Verse 9, he says, how can a young man keep his way pure? He wants to know how do you actually do that, and he answers that by saying, well, you meditate on the word. You go to the word, you keep the word, you obey it, and you live in a way that's pleasing to God. But what I want you to know is from 9 and 16, before we get to 17, is that the psalmist doesn't think of, I need to study God's word and that's somehow apart from God. His study of God's word is directly related to his pursuit of God himself. Look at verse 10. It says, with all my heart I have sought you. Right? It's not saying your word. I have sought you. It's a relationship that he's after. Verse 11, your word have treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. He's concerned about not sinning against his father. He's concerned about that relationship. Verse 12, blessed are you, O Lord. He doesn't look at the scriptures and say, wow, the scriptures tell me deep truth. He looks at the scriptures and says, this, these scriptures, God's ordinances, God's testimonies, God's law, it tells me something about God that I have to praise God for. It's, he cares about the relationship he has with God. So he's devoting himself to God's word but it's not an intellectual exercise. It's not some kind of obligatory habit that he has to do. It's out of a desire to know God. It is, it is an intense pursuit of God himself to live in obedience to God's word and thereby, and thereby be blessed to live in a way of divine approval before him. So verses 1 through 16 is kind of that intro. When we get to verse 17... And that stanza, the gimbal stanza, he, he brings this thought of, of being blessed, of, of following God's word to the real world. In verse seven, in this stanza, particularly in verse 21 and, and following, we're introduced to people that we haven't been introduced to in Psalm 119 yet. And that's his, the enemies, the arrogant, the proud, 
the princes that are, that are conspiring against the psalmist. And that's one of the reasons I love this psalm. This psalm brings God's word to real life. Where there's trials and there's enemies and there's discouragement and slander. It gets real. And, and the psalmist doesn't pull back from difficult situations. He doesn't say, oh, let me just stay theoretical and, and say God's word is great. He says, let me bring God's word to, to the discouragement, to the darkness, to the, the trials and adversity. And when he does that, we're able to see the magnificent power of God through the word of God in the life of the believer. And so this psalmist starts this stanza by looking to God for help. He looks to God for help, and that brings us to our first point for this morning. The first point we're going to see is that the, if we want to have the word of God be impactful to our lives, to change us, to grow us, to encourage us, we need to depend on God. This is a believer's dependence on God. So look at verse 17. Look at what the, what the psalmist request. Verse 17 says, Deal bountifully with your servant, that I may live and keep your word. So the first request here we see is deal bountifully. That's, that's a request. That's the imperative that he has that he's asking God for. And in the Hebrew, that is one word, literally meaning to deal appropriately. Or, or to deal completely. And what determines whether it's bountifully or even evil or, or wickedly is the context and the relationship. That's what determines that whether it's going to be a bountiful, deal bountifully, or, 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 or deal harshly. It depends on the relationship. And so what the believer is, is saying here, he's praying to God, he's praying to God in the context of a relationship, saying, God, I am your servant. Notice that he says, he calls himself your servant. I am your servant. And so what I'm asking you, Lord, what I'm, I'm coming to you to plead to, to you before, before you is that you would deal appropriately with me as your servant, as a good king would to a servant. I think uh, Psalm 13, you can just, uh, write, we won't go there, but Psalm 13 verses 5 and 6 uh, gives you a little bit more context about how this word is used. There David writes, um, he writes, I have trusted in your loving kindness, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. So you, you, you can see a lot of good things the Lord's doing. I will sing to the Lord because, and this, here's that word again, because he, ha, he has dealt bountifully with me. So you look at that context, what I just read, is like there's loving kindness, there's salvation. He's singing to the Lord. That context, that relationship means that God is going to deal bountifully. So the psalmist in 119 He's saying, deal appropriately. You can say, deal bountifully with me, Lord. I, I need you to act on, on, on my behalf. I'm not coming to you out of entitlement. I'm not coming to you in pride or, or a complaining spirit. I'm coming to you, Lord, as your servant, as someone who is in humble submission to you and is completely dependent on how you deal with me. And I'm asking you to deal with me as your servant to deal bountifully with me as your servant. Now, if you read the rest of verse 17, we see the purpose of this. Why is he asking that? The rest of verse 17 says, well, he says, I'm asking you because that I may live and keep your word. He needs God to act so he can live. Now, there's an aspect of that that's, that's probably a real for physical life. Right? As I said, there's verses 21, 22, and 23. You do have this, this um, uh, adversity, right? These enemies are going after him. And so there, it, there, there could be a sense of, I, I, I need you to save my life physically. But I don't think it stops there. This, for the psalmist, escaping, escaping life, God's saving him from that is not enough. Because notice what he says. He wants to live and keep his word. The psalmist wants to pay special attention to the word, to follow it, to obey it. That's what he means by keep. And so the bountiful treatment from God that the psalmist is looking for isn't, isn't so he can live an in, in easy, carefree life. He's not asking God, deal bountifully with me so, so I could, it could go well with me, so I could have a good career, so I could have a, so I could have a family, so, so I could do what I want. He's saying, Lord, I don't want anything temporal. I don't want anything worldly. 
I'm praying to you, God, because I'm depending on you to, to give me life and to keep me in your word. And so the psalmist is saying, I want to live and I want to obey. Living and obeying for him go together. They're one in the same. I, I, like, I like thinking of a, of a well-watered plant. You can have a plant. We have a, a, a plant in our, uh, in our kitchen, and as we can, we can put soil in it, we water it, or we're supposed to water it. And, um, and that's what we could do to, to help it. But what else does a plant need? Something with photosynthesis, right? It needs light. I, it needs to be, yes, well-rooted and watered, but it needs light. It needs to be living in the light. And so we, just like that plant, we need to be well-watered, well-planted in the word, but we need light. We need God to shine the light from his word, from, from the Holy Spirit, shine light to us so that we could live in accordance to his word. And that's what he means. That's why he's saying living and keeping. I want both. So that, this is his prayer. The, 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 the psalm is saying, the first way I'm going to depend on God today, the first way uh, I'm going to ask God is that I want him to deal well with me in such a way that I could live and keep his commandments. Let me ask you this. Um, do you pray like that? I think uh, when we come before God and pray, we tend to ask God, for something, right? To get us out of a difficult situation, maybe to guide us in, in making a decision. Nothing's wrong with that. But look at what this, the mind the psalmist has. He has a, a greater end there. Um, do, in other words, do you say, Lord, I need your help in such and such situation. But more than that, what I really want, Lord, what I really need your help in is keeping your word. Lord, use this situation so that I would follow and cling to your word more. That's the psalmist's heart here. Yes, he has adversity. He has enemies. He has people conspiring against him. And we're going to talk about it in a moment. But in this verse, he's like, I want God to help me keep your word, to keep his word. So the psalmist continues to petition God. He says, I'm depending on God to, to deal bountifully. But then in verse 18, I need God to, to show me something. He wants God to keep his word and more importantly, to know what it means for his life. So look at verse 18. He says, open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. So the psalmist is asking God to open his eyes. The, the word there for open is, like, is the same word for like uncover. Uncover my eyes, Lord. I can't see it. I need the veil taken off, so to speak. Uh, and only God can do that. Only God can show you his word. I think of the kids' game, uh, Pin the Tail on the Donkey. Um, I remember playing that as a kid uh, and, then, and seeing my kids playing as an adult. And I'm like, why do we blind kids and then give them a tack and let them walk around? Um, but I remember as a kid, I was being covered, and, and my eyes are covered. And I, in my mind, I'm like, okay, I'm going to picture the donkey, picture or whatever it was. Picture the donkey, and, and there it is. There's my reference frame, um, you know, Set up a, or set up a coordinates in my in my mind. I'm like, okay, I just need to go straight. Uh, and then I would go place the pin there, quite confident. Take off my my bandana or whatever it is, and and see that I was I was way 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 off. And I just remember thinking like, if only I didn't have that bandana, this wouldn't be a problem. <laughs> this would be an easy game. Um, but I think that's kind of the idea that we have here with uncovering. The psalmist wants to see God's word so clearly so that he doesn't miss a mark. And we don't have to go to God's word with a bandana. We don't have to go to God's word blindly and just hoping that it just makes sense. We could go to God, go to the author of this Bible and ask him, Lord, open my eyes. Take off this covering so that I can see. Now, I love what the psalmist adds here. He's not just saying, like, let me see. It's not just like he has an cur uh, intellectual curiosity. And it's not that he's trying to figure out, like, what's the right interpretation of the Bible, right? He's not, not really concerned with that. He's, he's looking with, I, I want to see it. I want to understand, yes, but I want to behold. I want to behold. That means that he wants to 
look at God's word and favorably contemplate it. He's praying, God, I can't see this on my own. I need you to open your eyes and I fully intend to take in and to live out whatever you show me. That should be our prayer, not just when we don't understand the Bible. We need to approach the scriptures realizing that if we get anything out from that, Anything, we get anything from the Bible and it becomes impactful and it convicts us, encourages us, it leads us to worship, anything, anything like that, we need to realize that that's God working, that that's God answering this prayer. And that happens because God wants you to see something. So don't take your quiet times, your times in the Bible, times in, right now, as something as passive and and not supernatural. God is working. He's showing us stuff. And so when he shows you stuff, you praise God for him working. And and you do what the psalmist says, that I'm going to follow that. I'm going to keep to what you show me. Okay, but what does the psalmist want to see? He's he's saying, Lord, open my eyes, and I want to behold, but what does he want to behold? He says, I want to behold wondrous things from your law. Uh, the word for law there is Torah. Uh, and it's not just speaking about the first five books of the Bible. Torah is a general word, meaning the totality of God's teachings. It is in God's teachings to the psalmist that the psalmist wants to see wondrous things in, in the law. Now, what do you think of when you hear that phrase? What's, what's a wondrous thing in the law for you? What do you find wondrous in the Bible? And then you can think of God parting the Red Sea. Um, I like, my, like my favorite is uh, the axe head floating. Uh, if you guys remember that story, some guy loses an axe head literally in like, the river, and Elijah's like, oh yeah, here's a stick. There you go, axe head. Um, and um, you know, my physics can't make sense of that. Um, you have, maybe you, you, you think of the miracles of Jesus. Right? Those are definitely wondrous deeds. But I think in the scriptures, you have providential acts of God as well. I think those those are wondrous deeds. Think of of the story of Joseph. You know the story of Joseph. His his brothers send him into slavery. Joseph then gets sent to Egypt, gets put in jail. Through jail and through God's workings and through uh, interpretation of dreams, he becomes Pharaoh's right-hand man. And through that, through Joseph becoming right-hand man, through God working, Joseph saves the whole region from famine. And his brothers, who sold him to slavery, has to come to Joseph in need of help. And when they recognize it's Joseph, when they recognize, oh, this is a brother we sold to slavery years ago, and they bow down before him and say, forgive us, we are your servants now. But what does Joseph respond to them? In Genesis 50, 20, what you meant for evil, God meant it for good. You know, when you talk about the wondrous things in the law, that is God working in an in a individual's life to show his glory. I mean, I mean there's tons of examples of that. And, and through the, the many examples we have in the scripture, every providential act shows us the character of God, that he is good and that he is powerful. But we also see wonderful things when we look at his son, I mean, just think about this, the uh, um, amazing testimony of Jesus, right? That, that Jesus was with the Father in glory. And Jesus being in the Father, with the Father in glory, gave up that glory, came down on earth, took on flesh, taking the form of a bondservant, humbling himself and becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. He asked, why did God do that? Why did God send his son to die, and why did his son, in loving submission of his father, not just come and die, but but die a death on the cross? You're like, well, the Bible says because he loved the world. Because he wanted man to be redeemed with him. And these are are wondrous things that God wants to show us. And And the more we dive in scripture, the more we see that there's no end to these wonders. 
Right? It is, the, the word of God is like a, a bottom, bottomless pool. You dive in and you go deeper and deeper depths and you find more and more treasures. But the only reason why you're able to see them is because God is showing you. Because God is opening your eyes to the amazing and the wondrous things in the law. And this is why we got to pray. This is why every time we open scripture, we pray. We need to recognize that, that we are dependent on God when we open up his word. And you know what you start to see when you start to pray that and, and, and you start to study and, and you're looking at, at Moses, you're looking at Joseph, um, uh, you look at Ruth and the apostles and what God is doing in the church and you say, wow, God is taking all these care of all these people. God is being faithful to all these people. You know what? I think God's going to be faithful to me. God has promised that he is the same God. That he never, doesn't change and that we are his children. He's working in our lives just as he was working in the scriptures. And as God shows you more and more of that, you want to see more and more of that. I love, a, there's a quote from Charles Spurgeon about this verse. He says this, he says, it is a test, a test mark of the true knowledge of God that it causes its possessor to thirst for deeper knowledge. In other words, if you're studying the Bible, you're seeing the knowledge of God, what's going to happen? You're going to have a deeper thirst for it. You're going to want more of it. It's going to, it's going to fuel you to go into it more. So we see that the believer uh, depends on God to deal with him bountifully, to open his eyes so he can live out God's word. Uh, but in verse 19, we see a third way believers are to depend on God. And it comes to the end of verse 19. Look at verse 19. Well, let's look at the end of verse 19. Verse 19 starts off with, do not hide your commandments from me. That's what it says at the end of verse 19. So it's kind of the opposite of verse 18, right? Verse 18 says, open your eyes. And then verse 19, at the end of verse 19, says, don't hide it. Don't conceal it. And why does he do that change? I think it has to do in part, a big part because of how verse 19 starts. He says, I am a stranger in the land. The psalmist is saying, I don't belong here. I'm a stranger. I'm a foreigner. The word literally means to be a resident alien. Usually it's reserved for someone who's been displaced from their home and is forced to live in another country. So I think the, the, the psalmist here, though, is, is communicating more than, than just like he's, he, he's just in another country. It's in his pursuit of God, in his endeavorings to live a God's word, that he's starting to be made keenly aware that this is not his home. And especially when you think about what the psalmist faces. The psalmist facing all this hostility, right? All these enemies. He had people conspiring against him. And so the threats he is experiencing is making even more evident that he doesn't belong here. And I just want to take a second here to talk about trials. You know, this is exactly what the word of God does for a believer. It makes us aware that there is something better than here. It makes us a desire to be with our Lord. And trials, when, when, we, when we balance out them out with God's word, pulls us up. We, we might go through a trial and you know, we're not going to like it. It's not going to be comfortable. It's going to be sad. It's going to be difficult. But as we stated God's word in that trial, we long for heaven. It pulls us up. It helps us look forward. We're either looking forward to when God calls us home and we rejoice now, or we're asking Christ to return. It is that blessed hope that we get from when the grace of God appeared, right? When we study Titus 2, the grace of God appeared. And so now we're looking for that blessed hope. So this is what we're devoting your, we're, we are devoting ourselves to when we come to God's word. It, 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 we want God's word to pull our thinking out of the 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 momentary afflictions, and I would also add, even out of the temporary joys. We want to see past those things and look up to heaven where Christ is. And so when the psalmist says, I'm a stranger, we too should see ourselves, we're strangers here too. We are citizens of heaven from which we are eagerly awaiting the Savior. So he's a stranger, but then let's go back to verse 19. How does that relate to what the psalmist says about God, about, about God hiding his commandments? 
I think the psalmist is looking here and he's recognizing that he doesn't belong here, recognizing that, that, that he is a servant, recognizing his dependence on God, and that is making him even more so commit to God and saying, God, I, I need your help. I need you to reveal your word, not hide it, because I'm so dependent on you that if you were to hide it, I lose my lifeline to, to you. As a surgeon, surgeon through his life, I am completely dependent on you to teach me, to tell me how to act, to, to, to tell me how to live a life that is worthy for your glory. So please, Lord, reveal your word, not hide it. I, I think he's just driving home his dependence to God in a very urgent, in a very dependent way. So we need to urgently plead, God, you know, God, teach us. God, make your word pull us up. Help us to incur, uh, use your word to encourage us as we're facing these trials and afflictions. And you know what I see from studying God's word? I see God being faithful to that request. Remember, we looked at all those people. When, you know what Daniel just read earlier today about Hebrews 11? This is by faith. Well, they did it by faith, but God is faithful. So, we see the believer's dependence on God to understand God's word, for it to be impactful in, our verse, in, in verses 17 to 19. But when you get to verse 20 now, the, the, the psalmist changes gears. He goes from, from making requests to God to now making a lot of I statements, and making a lot of statements of commitment. And so we get to our second point for this morning, and that is the believer's devotion to the word. So you can see that change in language in verse 20. Look at verse 20. He says, My soul is crushed with longing after your ordinances at all times. My soul is crushed. It literally means to be worn down or, or grinded down. Uh, I think of a, of a motor and, and um, what's called a pestle, right? Um, how if you want to grind something to a fine powder, you put that object in and you grind it down with that with that motor and pestle. And, and he's saying, this is what's happening to, to my soul. Now, the soul there is referring to the whole person, it's referring to his desires, his, to his cravings, to, to his wants. He says, I am being crushed. My soul is being crushed by, well, what is it? What does the verse, verse 20 say? By longing, right? With longing for your word. So we're in question for longing for your word. I, have you ever missed someone or something so painfully that you just, you just wanted to see them. Um, I have a quick example. When uh, Danielle and I were dating, we, we dated for two, uh, we started dating, and when I say dating, we became official, and I had to learn what that meant. So um, we started dating. Two weeks later, I, I left. I went to the East Coast and was doing some like research stuff. And so I didn't see Danielle for nine weeks, um, and so what we would do is we, were, we would write letters to each other. Um, now, it, it was the, the 1900s, but the late 1900s, so <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not that old. Um, so we wrote letters to each other, and I remember going to, there was this place where they would kind of give off care packages and letters that would come in, because they'd all come into one place and they hand it out. And you know, they'd say different names, and here's your letter, here's your package, and how we weigh in there, and they finish, and it was like very much like, I don't know, I feel like this has been in a movie where like you go up and like, is there any package for me? And say, scram, kid, get out of here. Uh, and I walk away with you know, a soft piano playing in the background. Um, but man, I wanted those letters so badly because I was missing her so much. Those letters were, were, were reviving because I, I, I was excited about this new relationship. We were growing. And so I wanted those letters. It was a longing that I was, that I was being crushed for when I didn't get those letters. And you look at the psalmist wording here. The psalmist has this very strong language, and much more so than my, me wanting to hear from, from my then-girlfriend. The, the psalmist wants to hear from God. He wants to hear from God, and he's saying, God, I, I have this desire that I want to hear from your word. And specifically, he's longing to hear God's judgment. Some of your translations might say ordinances. That's, the word there is judgments in the Hebrew, and it is... What God says is right and wrong is what God determines to be good and bad. And the psalm is saying, I'm longing for the ruling of the righteous judge. I want to see and hear and know how he rules. And notice how he qualifies that desire. 
He says, I want to know that at all times. Every situation, every occasion in my life, I want to long and have God's word. There's no situation that, that can quell that desire. There's no distraction. There's nothing that's going to discourage me so that I go away from God's word. It is my commitment to God's word and my longing. Does that match your desire? Does that match your, your experience with God's word? Do you have that longing, crushing desire? And I know that sometimes we don't. I know that sometimes we don't want to approach God's word. Why don't I ask you, what, how do you meet that, that apathy? Do you pray what the psalmist prayed earlier? Lord, show, open my eyes to see wondrous things in your law. Uh, I could put it this way. How about you pray this? God, sh show me what I'm valuing over your word. Show me what I am more eager to hear, more eager to do over your word, and take those things out of my life. That's a more dangerous prayer. But we see the, the, the richness and the vastness of God's word is going to be worth it. So the believer's devotion to the word, he, the, the psalmist starts by looking at desire, but then the psalmist continues and he says, I'm devoted to your word because I want to live in contrast to the world. His devotion to the, wor to the word is going to be in contrast to the world. And we see this in verse 21. Verse 21, he says, Lord, you, talking about God, God, you rebuke the arrogant, the cursed, who wander from your commandments. So Lord, I, I ask you to deal appropriately with me as your servant. And I know you deal appropriately with those who aren't your servants, with those who are proud. Or another translation, with those who are insolent or presumptuous. These are people who are wise in their own eyes. And the psalmist says that God rebukes those people. That's a strong word. You know, rebuke, you kind of make you think of someone like, don't do that. Rebuke is a lot stronger than that. You, you, you can think of rebuke. You remember Jesus was on the sea with the disciples and the disciples were sleeping and they thought they were going to die? They would wake up Jesus, do you care that we're about to perish? And Jesus stands up and says he rebukes the wind and the sea and they obey him. That was a showing of Christ's authority over creation. But that word for rebuke doesn't just get used from between God or Christ over, over creation, over nature. It gets used over, over nations, over Israel, that God rebukes Israel, that God rebukes Satan. It is a strong word that is showing God's power to stop or judge anyone who is against them. So God rebukes the proud. But the psalmist goes on to say that, the, that these people are cursed. Now, maybe you hear cursed, you think like a hex or a spell, right? They can't, they forever can't do something. Curse in the Bible is biblically opposed to being blessed, right? Those are two opposite things. And what would we say blessed is? Blessed is living in divine approval before God. Therefore, being cursed is living in divine disapproval. That God is looking at the proud and saying, these people are not with me. I am, in fact, against them. And you look, and Psalmist continues, and, and so you, you see that he's, he's saying a proud, he's, he's saying that they're, they're cursed, and then he uses a term here at the very end of verse um, 20, it says, 21, it says, who wander from your commandments. Now, when I first, or, or who stray from your commandments. Now, when I first read that, that, that word sounded a little um, not strong. <laughs> For someone who's proud, someone who's cursed, they stray. I would think they scoff at the commandments. That's what I would want to, want to write. But you put stray. And so, well, who strays? Well, if you have kids, you know kids stray. <laughs> you ever been to a busy market or to Disneyland? Tell the kids to stay close. And you take two steps, you look back, and they're... Psh, Gone. They're over there because they got distracted looking at a store or they saw balloons or it's their first time wearing shoes and they're just looking at their shoes. <laughs> and, and they get distracted. And so they, they, they walk away from the safety and comfort of their parents, not intentionally, but because they're after something else. 
And the arrogant that the psalmist is talking about, he's saying that these people are not interested in pursuing their heavenly father or in, pursu in pursuing the Lord. They're not interested in that. The commandments that God gave us to, to keep us on the path of life, the proud and the arrogant, they don't care. They are interested in their own things. They are seeking after their own pleasures and their own wants, and they're not concerned about God's authority. And you see this today with the church. There are some people in the church who call themselves believers, and, 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 and they might obey, they, they might go to church, they, they might do some of the things. But you know the difference between someone who's blessed and someone who's cursed? The difference is that the someone who's blessed their concern is not just in obeying God's law. Remember what we saw in Psalm 118. The concern is relationship. The concern is, is they want to be pursuing God. They love God. They don't want to stray, not because, not because it just follows rules, but because they want to be close to their heavenly father. That's the difference between a cursed and a blessed, a cursed person and a blessed person. And that's what the psalmist sees. He, he, he desires for the word of God, right? He longs for them, but the proud and the presumptuous, they're cursed not because of, of just willful disobedience. They're cursed, as one, one preacher said, they're cursed because of a lack of true willful commitment to be obedient. There's not that commitment. They just see ex externals. And if, if you think you're standing before God because you could point to a set of rules that you follow, or because you think you're, you, you have more good than bad in your life, then the Bible says you fall under this presumptuous camp, that you are the proud, you are the cursed, that you stray from his commandments. God's word tells us that we, we've all sinned and fallen short, and you can't do anything to make up for that. But remember we talk about the wondrous things. The wondrous thing here is that Christ has provided that shortcoming. Christ came and died for our failures. He, he took on the wrath reserved for us and in turn gave us his righteousness. So if you want to be counted with the blessed and not the cursed, if you don't want to face the rebuke of God, then the Bible says you put your faith and trust in Christ. And when you do that, you live in fullness of joy with him. Now, if you're a believer today, then, then living and a commitment to God's word means that your life, your desires, what you decide to do uh, and, and long for should look differently from the world. There should be that contrast with what you desire to do. And when you have that contrast, there's going to be trouble. And that's what happens to the psalmist. Look at verse 22 and 23. We, we see the devotion to desire, to desire his word, the believer's devotion to desire. We see the believer's devotion in contrast to the world, but also we're going to see now the believer's devotion in face of enemies. The believer's devotion in the presence of enemies. So verse 22 and 23, we're going to, we're going to take these two verses together. It says, Take away reproach and contempt from me, for I observe your testimonies. Even though princes sit and talk against me, your servant meditates on your statutes. So he starts in verse 22 and he says, remove shame and contempt. Shame and contempt. These, both these words carry this idea of, of casting blame or, or scorn onto someone. It, it has the idea of taunting, of mocking. Um, and the psalmist is likely receiving that from the arrogant that he mentioned in verse, 20, in verse 21. But he's also receiving that from the princes. Right? In verse 23, it, it is these princes, and what I mean by princes, uh, they, these are either government or, or military officials. Um, it could also be in, in a more broader sense, just, just people with prominence and influence. Right, these are those princes. So there's people who are in some kind of authority over the psalmist. And these people, it says that they, he, they are sitting and talking against me. They are actively planning and conspiring against the psalmist. Now, a lot of people will look at that and say, well, that sounds like Daniel. Therefore, Daniel wrote the psalm. Now, okay, hold on there. <laughs> I think there's some evidence for Daniel writing the psalm, but it does fit Daniel. Right? You think of Daniel living in Babylon, desiring to be faithful to God's word and standing against the request that's being made to him. 
And I specifically, and it happens a couple times, but I'm specifically thinking of, um, I believe it was Daniel 6, when the officials were saying, we don't like this Daniel, we don't like how he's rising up, we need to get him, but we can't find anything on him. The only thing we know about Daniel is that he follows the law of his God. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to make a law that makes following God impossible. And I bet you he'll do that. First of all, what a great testimony, right, for Daniel. If that is the contempt and shame that you get because you're being faithful to God and people are like, I bet you he's going to be faithful or she's going to be faithful to God, praise the Lord for that. But these people are depending on Daniel to be faithful to God and follow him. And so they make this law that, that you could only worship or bow down to the king. So what does Daniel do? I think it's literally the next verse after that. He goes up on the rooftop, bows down, and prays to God. He prays to God. He prays to God even though I'm sure he was, he knew, he was playing into their trap. He knew what they were doing. That I'm going to be faithful to the Lord and I'm going to entrust myself to him with whatever happens to my faithfulness. You guys know the story. He's throwing the lion's den and the lions don't have an appetite for him. God saves him there. That's exactly the resolve of this psalmist here. In fact, it, it is the basis that he asked God in verse 20, uh, 22 to take away reproach, to roll away the reproach and contempt that he has. He says, God, roll this away, take this away from me because I observe your testimonies. I observe your testimonies. He's asking God, God, I'm, I'm committed to you and to your word. I obey it, I keep it. And so I'm asking you, that that would be evident to others and then you could remove this from, from me. Now that doesn't always stop contempt. I'm sure many of you have in some way and in some time been subject of ridicule, of shame because you decided to follow God. And you look at this and say, well, I, I want to pray that, but God didn't take it away. But I think when you plant yourself in God's word, when you keep yourself in God's word, you, you, you inundate yourself, you, you bury yourself in what God says is right. And you're able to say, I know what those people are saying are false. And I know what God thinks of me. And I know that's right. And I know that's true. Alex Spurgeon, again, he says, he says, it's the best way to deal with slander is to pray about it. God will either remove it or remove the sting from it. So we go to God's word in commitment and devotion to him, even in the face of our enemies. Now, I love how verse 23 ends. Verse 23 is like, yes, I have these people, even these, these princes over me, and they're conspiring against me, but you know what I'm going to do? End of verse 23, he says, your servant meditates on your statutes. I just love that resolve. And, you know, how many of us get into a conflict and we just think over in our minds, man, uh, I hate how that happened. I hate that, that this person said this to me. And, and, and it just stays with us. You know what the psalmist says here? The psalmist says, I meditate on your statutes. To meditate means to toss over in his mind. He's not, he's not focusing or concentrating on everything that's against him. He's focusing on what God says. He's not going to God. He's not going to God saying, fix this, Lord. Take me away from it. He's saying, God, I want to focus on your, on your word. So despite the enemies around him, despite having an active conspiracy against him, the psalmist sits back. And it's kind of like Psalm 23, right? Psalm 23, verse 5. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil and my cup overflows. That's what the psalmist is doing. He's saying, I'm feasting on your word. And yes, there are enemies all around me, but I am finding refreshment. I am finding peace because I am meditating on your word. So this is a believer's devotion. Devotion and, and longing for the word in contrast to the world and in, in the presence of the enemies. And so the psalmist closes this, and we'll close our time here with this, in verse 24. He says, this is a believer's devotion to delight in the word. Verse 24, your testimonies also are my delight, and they are my counselors. You know what the psalmist is doing here? He's saying emphatically, 
And indeed, your testimonies, they are my prized possessions. They are the things that I go to to find my utmost joy in. And not only that, but I go there because they're my counselors. I don't listen to the people going against me. I don't take what they say to heart. I go to your word to find my comfort, to find my direction and my guidance. But I, I, I need you, God, to work. And so we look at this section as a whole, and, and we're seeing the two, two disciplines in play here, right? There's a devotion to God's word, but we didn't get to the devotion to God's word without dependence on God first. If we are to have the word impact us in a way that, that changes us, in a way that encourages us and strengthens us, we need to go to God's help, or we need to go to God for help, but we also need to live in that divinely enabled commitment. So two things I want for you to do today. One, pray that God shows you these wondrous things. Pray that God makes the scriptures, the Bible, so rich to you, so appetizing to you that it is your daily bread. You need it to live. And you've plunged into the depths of the riches that's found in scripture. So pray to God. And then second, commit. Commit to following the Lord and the word at all times. Don't get distracted by, by things in times of peace. Don't get discouraged when you find yourself in spiritual warfare or in, in, in affliction. You stay on God's word. And may the word be your burning desire that fuels your Christian walk until we are united with our Christ and Savior in glory. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the clarity and, and the hope that we have, we, that we find in it. I pray, Lord, that, that we would just do just that. I pray that you would show us these wondrous things. Give us a desire to, to dive in, that we would wake up so excited to learn more about you from your word. And I pray, Lord, that you would keep us. Just like the psalmist says, Lord, that you would not hide your commandments, but that you would open our eyes and that you would enable us to have that commitment before you. Thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus to die for us, that, that we are made new creations, that in, in believing the veil is in fact taken off and we see the glory of Christ. And I just pray, Lord, that that will come through in the scriptures, even as we sing today. Praise Jesus' name. Amen.